Hey everyone, and welcome to MCAS review number four. So we're going to be talking about magnetism and then um, getting into vibrations and waves. So let's get started. Um, so starting off, let's talk about magnets. So um, last review, we were talking about how our electrical forces can attract and repel. And so keep this idea in mind when we're talking about magnets, because um, magnets have poles, they have a north and south pole, and they actually have a magnetic force that can both attract and repel. And so like poles, like a north and a north or a south and a south, are going to have a force that repels one another, where unlike poles are um, like a north and a south, they're going to attract. Sound familiar? It should. Um, and so a north magnetic pole can never exist without the presence of its south pole. So that is what's really different between um, our electro forces, our electric forces, I should say, um, that, you know, our, um, our charges, they can exist on their own, but our magnetic poles, they cannot and so um, the if you were to ever break a magnet, like you were probably demonstrated to in class, if you were to break a magnet, what you're going to have is more magnets. And that's because the magnetic force itself has is dependent upon the atoms themselves and their spin. So um, magnetic fields transmit these magnetic forces. And again, you were probably demonstrated this in class where you had that bar magnet and then we poured some iron filings over like, um, like a whiteboard. And then, uh, you know, the, you could see the magnetic fields, those iron shavings uh, fell into the line of the magnetic forces. And so the direction of your magnetic field is always going to run from north to south. And on your field, um, on this magnetic field, the stronger the magnetic field is where those lines are closer. Okay, and again, it's kind of like our vectors in this way. It shows magnitude and direction. Um, and so it's always going to run from north to south. The closer that those field lines are together, the stronger the force. And so magnetism and electricity are very much interconnected. So think back to your atom. Um, remember that the atom has a positive nucleus that's made up of protons and neutrons. And then you have these electrons on the outside and they have a negative charge. And so if we were to put an electric charge um, just on its own, it would have an electric field. And then if we were to put that electric charge into motion, then not only would it have an electric field, but it would also have a magnetic field and so this is when you would probably learn about that right hand ruling class right if you would stick out your right hand that thumb would represent the motion of your electric charge and then your four fingers would rep represent the concentric circle that your magnetic field makes and so again a charge in motion um, is going to have both an electric property and a magnetic property and that's where we get these magnetic fields so um, this magnet, like magnetism as a force, is um, all stemming from charges in motion. Um, and so uh, the spin of, of an atom itself with those electrons orbiting around, not only do those electrons orbit, but they also spin like a top. And that's really important because, as you know, not all material is magnetic. So why is that? Well, in some materials, the spin of those electrons actually cancel out one another. Um, think about it, one like the one electron is going like clockwise and the other one is going counterclockwise. So you can imagine that that magnetic field is going to cancel out one another. So um, where the electrons are actually spinning in the same direction, again, think of both of them going clockwise or both of them going counterclockwise, then the magnet itself is going to be stronger. Again, it depends on that spin. And so when we have um, the uh, material that can be magnetized, like iron or cobalt or a ferrous material, we can actually align those clusters of atoms. And so those clusters of aligned atoms are called magnetic domains. And again, think about the spins of those electric charges. Um, think about that they're all kind of going in different ways with that clustered aligned atom, but then we want to arrange them so that they're all going the same way. So there's a bunch of different ways that we can arrange them. Um, but if we were to choose one and then slightly magnetize it, we can see that those domains that are represented by the arrows there are getting more and more slightly aligned. And then if we were to keep, I don't know, rubbing that um, iron over a magnet, 
then we're going to see that those domains are going to align themselves with the magnet itself. And so what that means is that the spins of those clusters of aligned atoms are now all aligned, and so we have a stronger magnet. And like always, if you were to break a magnet, it's still going to have both of its poles, so basically you would still have two magnets. So magnetic induction is um, taking a permanent magnet and then introducing it to a soft magnetic material, like a thoroughest material, like iron, um, and then um, inducing that uh, piece of iron in order to have um, a magnetic induction. So what that means is like if you were to like... Um, again, like uh, rub a magnet over like a paper clip, then you can actually induce that paper clip into being itself a temporary magnet. Um, and now this temporary magnetism only works as an attraction. It does not work as a repulsion. So the important thing to get out of this lecture is that electric current and magnets are very much um, related. All right, so if we have a current carrying wire, which we learned about in our last review, um, that electric charge going through the wire, then again, if we have a charge in motion, then there's going to be a magnetic field around that. And so if we were to coil that wire, then what's going to happen is that those magnetic fields are going to start to bunch together. And so as we decrease the distance between those magnetic fields, well, then they we're going to have a stronger magnetic force. And so um, electric charges passing through a wire produce a magnetic field. And again, if we put more charges in motion, then we're going to have a stronger magnetic field or magnetic force that is produced. So um, on this question, iron filings are placed near a coil of copper wire. Which of the following will most likely cause the iron filings to move? Go ahead and take your best guess. Okay, so the answer for this one is C, and D it looks very enticing, right? You really want to choose that one. For some reason, you know, if you put more coils in it, oh wow, that must be a stronger magnetic field, only if there's current running through. And so if there's no current running through, then more coils isn't going to do anything, because remember, this magnetic force is all dependent upon electrical charges in motion. So what we need to do is if we have a coil of copper wire, um, if we were to send an electric current through that copper wire, then what we're going to produce is a magnetic field, and so our iron filings are going to move um, in the direction of that magnetic field. Yay! So next question, a magnetic compass is placed near an insulated copper wire. When the wire is connected to a battery, the compass needle changes position. Which of the following is the best explanation for the movement of the needle? All right, so let's talk about this one. So a magnetic compass is placed near an insulated wire when the wire is connected to a battery. So the wire is having current sent through the battery. So we have these electric charges in motion. There's going to be a magnetic field around that wire. And so we're going to see that the compass needle is changing position. And so this was probably demonstrated to you in class with maybe like a bar magnet or something like that. But your compass itself is like a baby magnet. Okay, so um, our poles within our compass are going to be attracted to that unlike side, or they're going to be attracted to the either the north or south, depending on where that compass orientation is next to that wire. So which of the following is the best explanation for the movement of the needle or the movement of the compass needle? Um, it's going to be C. The current in the wire is producing a magnetic field and exerts a force on this needle. Again, that magnetic force. So again, think about this little compass having its own little, again, magnetic field, because um, it is a, like a little magnet. And so when we introduce it to um, a stronger magnetic force with this wire, then that needle is going to orientate itself to the unlike side, um, so like a north to south or a south to north. So the Earth itself is actually a giant magnet. It has a giant magnetic field. And so we have like the geographic north and geographic south of our Earth, but we also have a magnetic north and a magnetic south of our Earth. And it's actually opposite to what you might believe. So um, our geographic north pole is actually the south pole of our magnetic field. And the geographic south pole is actually the north pole of our magnetic field. And again, think back to our compass. Um, that north pointing needle is always going to point towards that south magnetic pole. Um, so again, unlike poles are going to attract.
And so scientists believe that the Earth's magnetic field is due to circulating molten iron or these convection currents within the inner and outer core of our Earth. Um, again, so when we have that um, electric charges in motion, a magnetic field is going to be produced. All right, so let's get into vibrations in waves. So as we know, vibrations are going to cause waves, or basically waves are caused by vibrations. And so most information gets to us in the form of a wave. Like as you hear me right now, that sound is in the form of a wave. How exciting. So sound energy is traveling to our ears in the form of a wave and also light energy that comes to our eyes is also in the form of a wave. So we're going to be talking about um, different types of waves, um, again, on our sound side and on our electromagnetic spectrum side. So let's get started. Let's start back to wave descriptions. Um, and so when we have like a back and forth vibration motion, so think of like a bobblehead and that head going back and forth. What we call that is an oscillatory motion. And so our swinging pendulum is actually a really great example of this oscillatory motion because it's a simple harmonic motion. Um, so what that means is that the simple harmonic motion can be represented with a sine curve and what you would typically associate with as a wave, like a wave pattern. And so from this wave pattern, we can get different things. Um, we can look at high points, which are called crests. We can look at the low points, which are called troughs. Um, and so crests, think of like your mountain. Um, and troughs, think of like what farm animals eat out of, right? Like those little bowls. <laughs> and so the term amplitude refers to the distance from the midpoint to the crest, or it could be to the midpoint to the trough. So what that midpoint line really represents is like the equilibrium position. So again, go back to the bobblehead. Um, if you weren't to apply any force to that bobblehead so that it wouldn't have that vibration motion back and forth, it's going to sit at an equilibrium position. And then once you apply that force, that head's going to swing back and forth across that equilibrium position. So what our amplitude really refers to is like kind of like the strength of our vibration. Um, and so it's going to give us kind of the height of this wave. Um, so again, it can be measured from that midline up or that midline down. And our wavelength is basically exactly what it sounds like. It's the distance from um, either the top of the crest to the other top of the crest, um, from trough to trough, or just one complete waveform. Um, and so wavelengths are really easy to see with something like our transverse wave right here in the um, picture below. Um, and then we're going to look at a longitudinal wave in just a second and see how we would calculate the wavelength for that. So let's get into our MCAS question. So the diagram below shows a wave trace. Um, distance Z is measure of? Okay, so distance Z is a measure of amplitude. So we can see that Z is measuring from that midline up. So that would be like the height of the wave. Um, and so it would be the amplitude. So the time that it takes for your vibration to complete one complete cycle is known as the period. And we represent that time with a capital letter T, also known as tau, but um, you can just like think of it as like the capital letter T, okay? And that capital letter T, again, represents the period. And again, that's the complete cycle time for one complete cycle. Um, so we measure that in seconds where frequency is the number of vibration an object makes in the unit of time. So really like frequency is like vibrations over time or cycles over time or waves over time or beats over time um, or something else over time. Okay, so basically your frequency is like how frequent that vibration occurs. Um, and so the frequency specifies the number of back and forth vibrations in a given of time. And um, and we usually think of it in terms of like a back and forth vibration over one second. Um, and that would be called a hertz. Okay, so we um, measure frequency in hertz, which we represent with an HZ at the end of our calculation for frequency. And frequency and period are very much interrelated. So frequency is one over your period and your period is equal to one over your frequency. And on your MCAS formula sheet, you're going to be given that period is equal to one over frequency. So just remember that you can always rearrange it in order to solve for frequency if you don't have it.
All right, so let's talk about the medium. So the medium is the matter through which the energy of the wave travels. Um, so what that means is like waves, as you know, cannot carry matter, they can only carry energy. So a couple of examples are like when you're speaking, the medium of the sound waves is air. When you throw a stone into a pond and you see those lovely ripple effect of the water, well the medium in that case is the water. When you were doing that awesome slinky lab and you were playing with the slinkies and you were creating waves through that slinky, guess what the medium was? Yeah, it was the slinky. Okay, so medium, that's like the matter or that um, environment through which the disturbance is being carried. Um, so let's get into some of our waveforms. So we have transverse waves. And so if you were to create a transverse wave, um, that would be like moving your hand up and down um, in 90 degrees or left to right. So basically, um, for a transverse wave, the energy moves at right angles or perpendicular to that vibration source. So what you should notice is that when your hand goes down, that waveform goes up. When your hand goes up, that waveform goes down. Again, that energy is moving perpendicular to the vibration source. So longitudinal waves, um, that energy is moving parallel to the vibration source. So a good example of that is our sound waves. So um, we have areas of compression and refraction. So what that means is that we have areas of high pressure and low pressure. So which of the following statements applies to a longitudinal wave? So our longitudinal wave, that motion of the medium is going to be parallel to the motion of the wave, or that energy is going to travel parallel to that vibration. So our next one, which graph shows a wave with a frequency of 50 hertz and an amplitude of 4 centimeters? So we are given a position in centimeters over time in seconds. Um, and so work this one out. Do your best. Okay, so the answer here was A, but let's figure out why. So we are given the frequency of 50 hertz. And so what we need to do in order to make, like have this make sense in terms of our problem, um, where we need to solve for, you know, the graph that has a position versus time, well, we need to solve for one complete cycle time, aka the period. So frequency is equal to one over your period, or period is equal to one over your frequency. So you're going to have one over 50 hertz, which is going to give you a period time of 0.2 seconds. And so if you look at the graph, that means that one complete wave or one complete waveform, so one up, one down, has to be completed within that 0.2 two second time frame. So that cancels out some of these. And then we have to look at the height or the amplitude. Well, it has to be four centimeters. So again, that cancels out some of these as well. And so your answer is A. So when two waveforms come into contact with one another, you're going to have interference that occurs. And these waveforms can be from any genre, right? So what that means is like, it can be off the electromagnetic spectrum, it can be a sound wave, it can be some other type of wave, okay? Um, and so what that waveform is, if you have two different waveforms coming towards one another, then there's going to be interference that occurs. Um, and so when these waves are what we call in phase, so if we had like a transverse wave with a crest and a crest coming towards one another, then what's going to happen is that those crests are going to like overlap one another. And what's going to happen is there's going to be like a reinforcement that happens and so um, there's going to be an increase in amplitude um, and so what we call that interference pattern is constructive interference you're basically constructing a bigger amplitude wave Destructive interference is when two out of phase waves come towards one another. So um, like when we're working with transverse waves, maybe it's like a crest and a trough coming towards one another. And so what happens is that that wave pattern actually neutralizes or it cancels out. So two students created waves pulses, sorry, two students created wave pulses, W and X, at the ends of a long flexible string. Uh, the wave pulses moved towards each other, met in the middle of the spring, and then moved away from each other as shown in the diagram. Which of the following figures shows how the spring appeared when the wave pulses met in the middle?
So as you can see from these two wave pulses, X and W, um, they have two crests or the tops of those waves meeting at the same time. So what's going to happen is that one crest is going to combine with the other crest and there's going to be an amplitude, an increase in amplitude that happens. Um, and so both of those amplitudes are five centimeters. So they're going to add together basically like A plus B. Um, and so you're going to get a new amplitude of 10 centimeters centimeters and then they're both going to kind of carry out again. So wavelength and frequency are related in terms of our wave speed. So the wave speed depends on the medium through which that wave travels, also on the wavelength and frequency. So V is equal to your wave speed, lambda is equal to your wavelength, and F is equal to your frequency. And I like to draw this in my little triangle. So if you were to draw a little triangle, V is going to go up top for your wave speed, and then frequency, and then lambda. And so if we look at our next question on this, we're going to use that in order to solve. So an organ pipe produces a musical note with a wavelength of 2.72 meters. What is the frequency of this note if the speed of the sound is 348 meters per second? So what you need to do for your problem is first identify everything that you are given. So you're given the wavelength and you're given the wave speed and you need to solve for frequency. So draw your little triangle out and cover up F for frequency and that's going to tell you to divide your wave speed divided by your wavelength. So 348 divided by 2.72 and so you're going to come out to about 127.9 or 128 hertz or B. What is the frequency of ocean waves that have a speed of 18 meters per second and a wavelength of 50 meters? So like before, make sure you identify everything that you're given in the problem. So you're given the wave speed, you're given the wavelength, you need to solve for frequency. Again, draw your triangle, but also this equation will be shown on your MCAS formula sheet. And so then you need to solve for frequency. So that's going to tell you to divide your wave speed divided by your wavelength. So 18 divided by 50. And so you should get a frequency of 0 0.36 Hertz, which is B. So now let's talk about Doppler effect. So if we were to consider a bug like bobbing up and down in the water, we can like visually see that, you know, the wave pattern that is going to be created is going to be coming from the vibration source of this bug. And the frequency of those waves is going to depend on like how frequent that bug bobs up and down. But if we were to put that bug into motion, then we're going to see a different wave pattern that is produced. Um, so there you can see from from A and B that when that bug is moving towards B, the frequency of that water wave is higher towards B and lower towards A. And that um, idea is known as the Doppler effect. It can also be used for sound, like think of a fire engine. When it's coming towards you, you hear a really high pitched sound. And when it's moving away from you, you hear a really low sound, um, like a wee. -oo. <laughs> Again, uh, if you want to make the fire engine noise, feel free. But if that's good, as long as it's going to help you remember the Doppler effect. But remember that when the um, source is coming towards you, um, that there's going to be a higher frequency. When it's moving away from you, it's going to be a lower frequency. And so what the Doppler effect depends on is not only the motion of the source, whether it's moving towards you or away from you, but also the motion of the observer. So you can see that the observer right now is standing still, but if they were to move towards the source or away from the source, again, the same type of idea is going to take place with the Doppler effect. So if they were to move for towards the source, uh, that frequency is going to be higher. If they were to move away from the source, that frequency is going to be lower. And so the Doppler effect is also used for radar, um, which is used to measure the speeds of cars. And so again, um, when that frequency is higher towards the um, source and then lower away from the source, again, the Doppler's effect is also used for light. Um, so when a light source approaches, there's an increase in measured frequency, and that's called the blue shift. And um, when it recedes from you, that's called the red shift.
So the police use radar devices that apply the Doppler effect to determine the speed of a car. The diagram below shows electromagnetic waves sent from a police car and reflected waves received by the police car. Um, so we can see that the police car has a speed of zero um, miles per hour and the car has 50 miles per hour. The police car is not moving and the other car is moving away from the police car. Which of the following best compares the waves sent and received by the police car? So the sent waves are going to have a higher frequency than the ones that are received. And that's because the car is moving away from the observer, which is the police car in this case. So the sent waves are going to um, be sent to the car at a higher frequency than what they are received back. Again, because the, um, the, so the, the car in front is moving away. So that received wave back is going to be at a lower frequency. So the received waves have a lower frequency and a longer wavelength than the ones that are sent. So let's talk about sound. So which of the following is an example of a longitudinal wave? So if the section itself wasn't a big enough hint, it actually is the sound wave. So we're going to find that the sound wave has a longitudinal wave. Um, and so it has areas of compression and refraction or areas of high pressure and low pressure. So sounds have different characteristics like pitch. So pitch is a description of our subjective impression of the frequency of sound. Um, and so Again, it's subjective, but when we hear like a high pitched note from like a flute, um, we, again, it's kind of different for everybody, but we want to just assume that that high pitched note has a high vibration or a high frequency and a low pitch sound like a foghorn, um, that's going to have a low vibration or a low frequency. All right, so high pitched, high frequency, uh, low pitched, low frequency. And so the average human hearing range is about 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. So anything that is above or below that is going to be um, something different. So it's either going to be infrasonic or ultrasonic. So infrasonic ranges are frequencies below 20 hertz and ultrasonic ranges are uh, frequencies above 20,000 hertz. So communicate uh, so elephants, um, they're uh, within that infrasonic range um, and bats, they are the ultrasonic range. So sound waves are longitudinal waves. So we have compressions and refractions. Um, and so when you send out a sound wave, um, it's going to vibrate those particles within the air. Again, those air particles aren't going to move when that wave transfers through because waves cannot carry matter. They can only carry energy. But what is going to happen is that there's going to be areas of high pressure and low pressure. So the areas of high pressure is known as a compression. Areas of low pressure, that is known as a refraction. And so we can measure our wavelength of like our longitudinal waves from compression to compression. And so as a source of sound vibrates, a series of compressions and refractions travels outward from the source. So the diagram below shows a sound wave being produced by a speaker in the density of air molecules as the sound waves travel to a listener's ear. Each second a section labeled with an X shows an interval between dense regions of the air molecules. What wave property does X represent? So you can see that those air particles are compressed and compressed, and we can see that the measured distance between those compressions um, is represented with X. And as we know, in our longitudinal wave, we're going to measure from compression to compression, and that's going to be the wavelength or the length of the wave. So sound can um, vary its speed depending on the medium through which it travels. So sound waves, they do require a medium in order to travel. So the mediums can be solids, liquids, and gases, but sound cannot travel in a vacuum. So think about space. Um, sound cannot travel in space or a vacuum, all right? It needs to be in contact with those atoms. And so the speed of sound, the speed of sound is going to be fastest in our solids, then liquids, and then slowest in our gases. And again, if you just look at um, the particles within our solids, liquids, and gases, in a solid, they have a fixed position, fixed volume, liquid, um, no fixed volume, but um, yeah, they're going to overlap with one another. And then gas, they're kind of all over the place. They're bouncing all over the place. And so um, as you can see, just from these representations of our states of matter, 
the speed of sound is going to be fastest in our solid, then liquid, then our gases. And speed can also depend on temperature. So an increase in temperature is also going to increase the speed of sound. A trumpet makes a low pitch note while a flute makes a high pitch note. The volume of both notes is the same. What is the difference? Uh, what is different from the two sounds as they travel through the air? So it is going to be wavelength. 